When I was in Costa Rica, my boys came to visit me and we had the most amazing adventure of all time. But like all good things, it must come to an end. And there was a day where they had to leave. And that was one of my hardest days ever because the reason I went to Costa Rica in the first place was to help break up with my kids because it's so hard when they become teenagers and they become their own people and have their own lives. It's so hard to let them go and see that this amazing relationship that you have, the way it is, living in the same house and doing all the same things and it just is coming to an end and it's so hard. So I decided I was going to go away and it would be so much easier. But then when they came and we had the best time ever and it was time for them to go, oh my gosh, it tore my heart out again. It was so hard. I was so sad and I'm not going to lie. I cried a lot, but the good news was my brother was coming later that day with his girlfriend. And so I had my moment, even thinking about it now, just really like whew, makes me emotional because I just love these people so much, these human beings so much. And it's just really hard to let go of what we have right now, even though I want them to go be free. Like my mission is for them to go discover life, but it doesn't mean it's not hard. So after they left and then my brother and his girlfriend left, I needed to find a new place to have an adventure because I, I was only in that town to visit with these people because it's a big touristy town and it's not really my jam. The beaches are super busy, parties all the time, like just like a huge tourist trap. So I had found this place. Literally, I could see it from the beach, Tamarindo. I could see it across the beach. And actually, when I was there, I'm like, oh my gosh, what is that over there? What's that place over there? There was a gorgeous beach with what looked like nobody on it. And so I started to investigate. And this is a beach called Playa Grande. And it was, I think, a 20-minute car ride because you had to go around the river actually you could go across the river this is crocodile river because it has crocodiles in it and when the tide goes down the river is low like it would come up to maybe just below your butt or somewhere in that range but there's crocodiles in there and you when you cross you would cross close to the ocean and the crocodiles, you know, technically don't like the salt water, but there have been, I think, two cases of people being attacked by crocodiles. So in that spirit, you could rent a boat to go across. Literally, it's just like the boat runs across back and forth and it's a 30 second crossing um, and it's like a dollar, two dollars. But when it's super low tide, the boats can't do it. And I had my big, huge suitcase. Now, listen, I had this super stupid, huge suitcase because I brought my tennis racket with me. And the only suitcase it would fit in is the largest suitcase. And so I couldn't take my suitcase and walk across the beach because once you get to the other side of Crocodile River, it's like a 45 minute walk on the beach. And I couldn't carry my suitcase because it was a huge suitcase. Okay, I'm not going to lie. I actually did walk across crocodile river because i had walked all the way down to the beach which is a 45 minute walk to the river and i wanted to go to tamarindo to go to the bank and get some groceries and the tide was out and so the boats weren't running and so somebody had just walked across the river and it came up to like their their waist and i'm like i'm gonna do it and as i was walking across the river I was so scared. All I could think was there was a crocodile that was going to eat me. So I tried to run across the river, but the bottom was really mushy and I, it was like running in quicksand and the water was up to my waist and it was like flowing down from the river, but up from the ocean. And that was like the longest minute of my life. I could not get across that river fast enough. And as I was getting in the middle of the river, I'm like, this was the worst idea I ever had. And then of course, once I got to the other side, I was like, whoa, I'm alive. That was so much fun. <laughs> and of course, on the way back, the tide had come in and and so the boats were working so I could take the boat across. I didn't have to walk across Crocodile River again. And I don't know if I would have done it. Yeah, okay. Who am I kidding? 
I would have walked across it again. So anyway, I got to rethink that strategy next time I travel. But nonetheless, I had I had found this place that I wanted to stay at in Playa Grande, literally right across the river from Tamarindo, super small town. And the reason I wanted to stay there was because there was surfing with nobody in the water. What looked like nobody in the water in Tamarindo is super busy. And the last time I surfed, I got nailed in the face with a surfboard and it made me mad. And I'm like, there's too many people here that don't know how to surf and are learning to surf, which is me. I'm learning to surf, but it just um, wasn't fun. So off I go onto my adventure to Playa Grande and I had to take a taxi to get there because I couldn't walk across the river down the beach with my big, huge suitcase. So I, I arrive in Playa Grande and I was staying at this place where they would give you a discount if you stayed for 28 days or more. And so I'm like, well, I'll just stay here till the end of my trip because it had everything that I wanted. And this is what I was looking for. I was looking for a place to surf, like a gorgeous beach where I could practice surfing. I'm not a good surfer, but I do love to surf. So I'm looking for beginner waves. And um, I had read that this is a wonderful place to surf. The waves are awesome. And right across the street from where I was staying, so I got the discount where I was staying and I was staying in a hostel with a, a woman's hostel. So there was four beds total. And that was like a reasonable price because Costa Rica is very expensive. And then literally right across the street from where I was staying was a tennis court. That's right, a tennis court. Now, unlike here, there aren't public tennis courts that you can just go and use for free. This was a one tennis court that some guy had built. So it's the tennis center in town. It's a small town. And he uh, rented out his court. So it was like a thing you had to go and pay for. So I went over and I introduced myself. I actually phoned him before I went. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I can hook you up. Don't worry, it's all good. And then I went and talked to him and he's like, yeah, well we don't really have any, you know, openings right now. And you can't play during the day because it's smoking hot out. So it's early morning or just before the sun goes down because there's no lights on the tennis court and there's no top on the tennis court. So it's super hot during the day. Anyway, I was super excited because in my mind, I'm like, I'm every day I'm going to go surfing. Every day I'm going to go play tennis and I'm going to get better at both of them. And when I went, I took a surf lesson and it was so good. I'm like, I got this. I'm a rock star. I could pop up. But the thing about the surf lessons is they push you and they don't necessarily teach you like how to read a wave and when to start paddling and all that fun stuff. So I was extremely successful when I was taking the lesson because he was pushing me and I was popping up all the time. And then when I went out on my own, I got hammered, of course, and I'd been surfing throughout my whole trip, but these waves were bigger they were bigger and they were, you know, close to a beach break. So not very forgiving when you wipe out because you're on the sand. And so when I went out on my own, I found I was getting the crap kicked out of me by the ocean. So the, for me, the waves were just too big and too powerful. So it wasn't fun for me to surf. It was more like going through the ringer, the washing machine every single time. And I ended up taking up boogie boarding or bodyboarding instead because I could just catch every wave. And I'm telling you, I felt like a little kid. I laughed out loud every time I caught a wave, which was all the time. That was the, my success rate went up exponentially. I was like a rock star body surfer, but I still didn't go out, out into the huge crazy waves. But it was so much fun when you're just laying on the board and it pushes you. So I ended up not surfing there but I did a lot of boogie boarding every single day, but I couldn't get into the tennis courts. No matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't get in. The guy wanted me to take a lesson and lessons were 60 bucks. I was on a tight budget. I'm like, I don't need a lesson. I just want to play tennis. I even joined the local Facebook group where I'm like, Hey, anybody want to play pickleball or tennis? I can organize a group because it's $40 rental. I'm like, I could do that. It's 10 bucks for an hour for tennis. No problem. And I just couldn't pull it together. And the, and the guy was super not helpful with getting me on the court, which I found really strange, very strange. And so my time in 
Playa Grande was not successful from the point of view of these are the two things that I wanted to do, surf every day and play tennis every day, and I didn't get to do either. But I met the best people and I had the best adventures. It was so amazing. This little town, I can't recommend it enough. It was just so beautiful. But along the way, when I did all of my journeys by far, the people I met made my journeys and I made some friends for life when I was there. It was just so, so good. And when I was there, I met this Swiss couple and we ended up going out, having some drinks and chatting, and they were telling me about their adventure. Now they started in South America and were traveling up through Central America. So they were deep into their trip by the time I came across them. And they were telling me how they were headed to Nicaragua next. And I was like, oh, tell me everything. Because I had already planned just to stay in Costa Rica for my whole three months. And they were telling me about where they were going next. And it was based on surf beaches. So I'm like, I need to know everything that happens on the rest of your trip. And when they left, they we kept in touch through social media and they would tell me where they were and they would rate their experience based on, because they had stayed in Playa Grande too. So they know the beach, they know the town and they would give me their feedback on whether, how, how they liked it compared to Playa Grande. And from that feedback, I decided, screw it, I'm leaving Playa Grande and I'm going to go just travel through Nicaragua. And I'm going to follow their path because they said, Heather, this place is amazing. Heather, the surf beach is insane. Heather, oh my God, you have to see. And I was like, oh, it was so amazing to have people going ahead and then giving me feedback, like people I'd actually met and could relate it to where I was currently staying. It was just so invaluable. So I'm like packing up my stuff, my tennis racket, my big, huge suitcase, like, God, that thing got thrown on top of buses and shuttles and all the things. So now I had to get from Costa Rica to Nicaragua. So I hired a shuttle. And what happens is you meet in a little town in a parking lot and you all get into the shuttle and then they drive you to the border. And then when you get to the border, you got to get out of the shuttle and then walk across and you have to go through two border crossings. You have to pay to get out of Costa Rica and then you got to get into Nicaragua. So you pay to get out one. And as I was at the teller paying, one of the guys that I was in the van with from Chile came up and he's like, hey, um, do you have any extra cash? Because we were told we wouldn't need cash and we don't have any. And it's $20 cash to get out. And there was no bank machine there. But there was a bank machine at the other border. It was like going into Nicaragua, but there was one at the other border. Anyway, he said, if you give me this, I'll, I'll pay you as soon as we get across the border. No problem. And I'm like, okay. Cause I like to help people. Okay, for sure. And it was him and his wife. So it was 40 bucks. I was on a tight budget. So for me, this was a lot of money at the time because my budget was like super, super on point anyway. So at the end of going through this, actually, when we were in the border for Nicaragua, it was so funny because we had to wait for everybody to come out the other side and some people got stopped and some didn't. And as we were waiting, there was this American couple who were like talking to this, um, I want to say Dutch girl. And they're like, what should we do? Should we split it? And I'm like, what are you guys talking about? The American girl had found an envelope on the floor and she thought it was the Dutch girls. And it was like, hey, did you drop this? And the Dutch girl said no, or I think she was Dutch or German. She said no. And what was inside of it was a wad of cash, a, just a wad of cash. And they're like, what should we do? The American girl. And they're like, well, let's split it, which was funny because the, the German girl or um, Dutch girl, she didn't do anything. So I don't know why they would split it, but they ended up splitting it. And it was like $650. So they walked out of there with like 325 American dollars. And I walked out of there 40 bucks in the hole because I think I never paid me back. But... It was such a weird experience. And I remember thinking, feeling bad, like, oh my God, somebody lost that money. That's horrible. But if they turned it in, the guards there would just do the same thing. They would just keep it and split it. So I could see why they would keep it. Um, 
but I, I felt bad that somebody, somebody lost like all their travel money. So that was sad to me. But the, then once we um, get to the other border, some guy is looking at a picture and he's like, yep, this is the girl come with me and get in this van. And we all get into a couple separate vans, with, mixed up the group again. And we get dropped off in our town. And the first town I went to was San Juan del Sur. And this was based on my friends that went before me. And it was the cutest little town. And the place that I was staying in was so cute. It was called the Kiss Rooms. And I'm like, what the heck is a Kiss Room? But the, the pictures online looked really good. And the reason it was called a Kiss Room is because it was based on, I think, um, a franchise which is called kiss ice cream so there was an ice cream stand and right next to the ice cream there was a pink door a small pink door and it was said kiss rooms and that was where i was staying so when you would go in the door and it was like a narrow hallway and then it just opened up into this little outdoor patio space that didn't have a roof and there was brick wall and plants on the wall and the kitchen is outside all the kitchens are outside and there were rooms and then there was my room and in my room it was just a basic room and my bathroom was across the hall so I had to go out of my room into the bathroom and it was my private bathroom but I had to go out of my room to get into it and it was full of cockroaches <laughs> which was awesome but it was the cutest little place because this little open air patio is where you would just meet the other people. I think there were like five rooms and I really liked it there because the lady who ran it, I can't remember her name. She lived upstairs. She was from Spain and she'd been in San Juan del Sur running this Airbnb. So she rented the property, but ran the Airbnb. So she's a little entrepreneur. So I love supporting female entrepreneurs. And she was so helpful. She just could give you all the answers, tell you all the places to go. And she had a couple of dogs and a couple of cats. And one cat would jump out of the tree at you and eat the flowers. And But it was just, it's such the cutest little place. I really like staying there. And it was easy to meet people because everybody would come and just sit at this little open air patio and when I was there I met some Canadians I met people from all over the world but one girl that I met she was a, a shy quiet girl and I believe that she was from Germany I can't remember I can't remember anyone's names because I met so many people on my trip like hundreds of people on my trip and it was definitely the people that made my trip so amazing but this girl was a young German girl and she would always be sitting in the on the patio and she would be smoking and studying Spanish. So she was taking a Spanish class, but she was very shy and kind of kept to herself. And I just invited her out. I'm like, girl, let's go out for some drinks. I was only in San Juan del Sur for two nights, maybe three nights. And I just went out every day and every night and did stuff. And so she was by herself so she didn't do too much I think she was a little bit leery about going out on her own so I invited her out and we went out for drinks and we had a wonderful time but as we were outside of our place by the ice cream shop there was a couple of Canadians young Canadians that we met and they were you know drunk having a good old time and it was funny because the one guy looked at us me and the girl and said oh is this a mother-daughter trip and I thought oh my gosh, at first I was like insulted. Like that was my first reaction. And then I stopped and I'm like, wait, Heather, you are old enough to be her mother. And that was when it really like shocked me. It, it kind of like woke me up a little bit to, I see myself as 23, 24, 25. That's how I always think of myself. Like that's just kind of the identity of, the age of where I'm at all the time in my life. I see myself as that person. So when the Canadian guy said, oh, is this a mother-daughter trip? And the reason I felt like insulted at first is because I'm like, I'm only 25. How could I be her mother? But that's not how old I am. Isn't it amazing how in our brains, we always see ourselves as a certain age. And when I realized that I was actually 54 and I was old enough, to be her mother because I have kids similar to her age. I was like, damn, wow, look at, 
look at me living my life. Like I believe that mindset is everything. And if I feel, if I think that I'm 25, then that's how my body is going to be. That's how I'm going to live my life. And that is a fabulous way to live your life. So how are you seeing yourself? What age are you thinking you are? Because we always are stuck at one age where we think we are. And I love asking this question of people because some people who have never thought about it before are really like shocked by the answer. Like this is how I see myself as like maybe it's like a 12 year old, maybe it's like 30, maybe it's who knows. But I do know that if I think that I'm 25, then that's the energy that I'm putting through the rest of my body. That's how I show up in my how I live my life every single day. That's the energy that I'm putting out. So that's what I bring back to myself. So my brain is thinking you're 25. You can do all these things. You're healthy. You're happy. You got all the time in the world. And that's how I create this fabulous energy and life for myself. But it was so funny that it took that person saying that comment and it's shocking me into like, damn, I am 54. Holy smokes. Because that's not my everyday awareness of myself. And it makes a big difference. So I just want to invite you to look at how do you see yourself? Because however you see yourself subconsciously without thinking about it is what you're creating every single day. So if you think you're unhealthy or you're old or you can't do these things, then then that's what you'll create. But the opposite is true too. If you think you can do anything, like I had dragged that huge suitcase with my tennis racket all through Costa Rica and Nicaragua and I got it down from, you know, like the top of buses and it was a pain in the butt, but I knew that I could do it because, hey, I'm just 25, so of course I can carry this suitcase around. So that's my invitation for you is like just to investigate how do you see yourself? So How do you see yourself and what are you creating? Is that a positive thing you're creating? Because if it's not, you can change it with your mindset because it's just a thought. The thought that I'm young and healthy, it's just a thought, but it's a powerful thought that I've created in my brain. And I'm saying it's just a thought because if it's not serving you, then you can change it. But if it's serving you, you run with it. That's what I do. I run with it. I every day that's the, what I'm thinking that's how I'm feeling that's how I'm showing up and I see it in the results that I create in my life and I want that for you too so contemplate this what age do you think of yourself as and why thank you for listening always 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 love yourself first and have an amazing day <laughs>